Uh, we are very happy to have Yingming Chen, who will tell us about the horowitz polshinsky solution and string microstates. Stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak. I'm very happy to be here. So today I will be talking about the horowitz polshinsky solution and string microstates. It will be partly uh, based on a paper that I wrote with Huang and Edward last year, and uh, also based on a paper that I wrote by myself earlier this year. So let me start with some motivation and uh, tell you what I, where I'm going in this talk. Um, as we all know, a big puzzle in our traditional description of black hole is that we only have one black hole solution. While we believe that the black hole uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the quantum mechanical theory is really describing an enormous amount of states. So here I'm drawing schematically all the microstates of the black hole. So you see there are individual eigenvalues of the system. But if we use the gibbons hawking procedure uh, and the Euclidean black hole to compute the entropy, we just get the coarse grain density of state. In other words, if we draw schematically the density of states, a smooth curve, which doesn't uh, reflect the underlying discreteness of the spectrum. Now, the fastball and microstate geometry paradigm proposes a particular way to uh, resolve this puzzle. Rather than a single geometry, there exists a large family of microstate geometries, each of which describes some coherent superposition of microstates. So this might not be uh, the best illustration, but just to draw it artistically, um, you will have a lot of uh, individual microstate geometries, each of which would describe some underlying microstates. And all of them would be horizonless geometries with a uh, uh, particular geometry near the horizon uh, depending sensitively on which microstates that you are already considering. Okay, so what I want to really discuss today in the talk is that consider perhaps the simplest fastball, which is a highly excited string gas in string theory. These two pictures that I just showed you seem to be combined in a very specific way. So there exists a single uh, horowitz pochinsky solution, which gives rise to the coarse grain density of state. So it gives you a smooth density of state covering all the microstates. Uh, it is somewhat analogous to the Euclidean black hole with a crucial difference that this solution in the Euclidean signature doesn't have, the, the Euclidean circle doesn't shrink, meaning that, meaning that it's a horizonless geometry. Now, I will also propose that there also exists a family of solutions which describes the form more fine-grained feature of the spectrum. So this, this point is in a paper that I wrote this year. So many of you might not have heard about this before. And I'm proposing that they might be viewed as the analog of the microstate uh, geometries for a gas of string. So now let me start. Oh, okay, before I start, I should say that these claims are only about the gas of strings uh, and I'm taking the gravity attraction among them to be very weak. Of course, much of the motivation of already considering a gas of string comes from the correspondence principle that was proposed uh, a long time ago between strings and black holes. For the most part of this talk, I will be really only focusing on strings. I will say more about the connection to black holes, uh, perhaps at the end of the talk. And uh, I believe Remy will also talk more about this in his talk. Now I'll start by describing the horowitz polshinsky solution. Okay, so the horowitz polshinsky solution was uh, first uh, introduced in the context of the correspondence between strings and black holes. To just set up the stage, we will be considering string theory in a capital D dimensional space time, time, time some internal space, which be left implicit throughout the talk. So it has long been speculated that if you start with a Schwarzschild hole in this space time without carrying uh, any charges, when you shrink the size of the black hole or let it evaporate, it will turn into a highly excited string gas when its size approaches the string scale. Now, the horowitz polshinsky solution was first proposed in order to resolve an apparent problem uh, in this correspondence. So let me now tell you what the problem is. Now, the correspondence principle is uh, motivated by, can be motivated by looking at the relation between the entropy and the mass for either a black hole or a string. Now for a black hole, the entropy is proportional to the structural radius times its mass just by dimensional analysis. So if you uh, plot it in the 
uh, entropy mass plane you see is upward bending curve because the slope of the curve grows together with the mass. On the other hand, if you consider the uh, entropy of a string, uh, a simple calculation in perturbative string theory tells you that the entropy at uh, high energy is, pro is linearly proportional to the mass with a coefficient beta hepatome, which is a number that is uh, of order the string length with some order one coefficient. Now, if you plot these, you get a linear curve uh, in this two dimensional plane. Now, a priori, you are only supposed to trust the black hole curve when the mass is very large, so the geometry is classical. And you are also only uh, supposed to trust the string curve when the mass is very small, so you can neglect all the gravity, uh, gravity effect. But a naive extrapolation of these two curves suggests that they meet at some point. And at this point, the entropy of the black hole is the same as the string, not only that, the size of the black hole, if you compare these two formula, the size of the black hole also becomes of the scale of the, uh, of the fundamental string length. So this is very provocative and it might bring you to think that since the black hole has the same entropy and the same size of the string, maybe we should really think of the black hole as a string. But this naive picture is not entirely correct at least at this level, because if you really look at the physical size of the string, the physical size of the string is much larger than the fundamental string size, because once you start to excite the string, it gets longer and longer. And this size grows as the square root of its entropy. So it's uh, much, much larger than the uh, size of the fundamental string. Okay, but in this analysis, in this naive analysis, the gravitational attraction was neglected. So one might expect that once you take uh, gravity into account, the gravity effect make, will make the string gas smaller. And perhaps the gravity is just strong enough to make the string at, at this mass to be of the size as a fundamental string, okay? So this problem was analyzed uh, by Horowitz and Pochinsky. Well, they considered an effective theory of the winding mode when we are very close to the hexagon temperature. So now let me say a little bit about the, uh, the hexagon temperature and the winding mode to set up some background for the discussion. Um, this number that I showed you earlier, the so-called inverse hexagon temperature is some number that is proportional to the fundamental string length with an order one parameter. It is important because it comes from the density of state of a single oscillating string. So if you consider the density of state for a single oscillating string, it grows at high energy as e to the beta hexagon times the energy. Therefore, if you consider the canonical ensemble partition function for a single string, you see it, it is only well-defined when the temperature is lower than the hexagon temperature. There is a nice space-time perspective of this fact. So we could, rather than considering the strings in Lorentzian signature, let's consider the string theory on a Euclidean background. Well, the Euclidean time is compatified on the circle with length beta or the inverse temperature. And here I'm drawing as a cylinder. Uh, well, the, this direction will be the spatial direction, which I, I will take to be RD. Now, whenever you have a circle in string theory and when the circle gets more, it's important to in include winding modes on, on this circle. So the strings can wind uh, around the Euclidean time circle and it can wind multiple times. But the part particular string mode that we will be interested in is the winding mode that winds only once. The reason that it is particularly important is that its mass is given by the following formula is proportional to the difference of beta square and beta hexagon square. So you'll see that when the inverse temperature gets close to the inverse hexagon temperature, the mass becomes zero and you have a light mode in your theory. You can describe this string mode via a complex scalar view in uh, little d dimensions. So just a, uh, uh, this is the free action for this scalar view. It is a complex scalar view because you really have two modes, one with winding number one and the other with winding number minus one. And this field becomes light when we approach the hexagon temperature. The idea of Horowitz and Pochinsky is to consider the effective field theory when we are very close to the hexagon temperature, but still below the hexagon temperature. So in terms of the parameters that I described earlier, it is when the difference of beta and beta hexagon is much smaller than the fundamental string length, okay? Now, 
whenever we consider effective theory, we want to identify the light fields in the effective field theory that uh, governs the long distance physics. Well, what are the light fields in our theory? So as usual, um, when we consider string theory, we have gravity uh, dilaton as well as the B field. But in this solution, the B field is not excited. So uh, I will not write it explicitly in the following. As I said, there is also a nearly massless field chi in this story. So you can write down such an effective action where well, you have an Einstein Hilbert term, a kinetic term for the dilaton as well as the action for the chi field. But there is actually another mode which I haven't talked about, which is this phi field, and we can call it the radian. It basically parameterizes the fluctuation in the size of the Euclidean circle. So the idea is that we fix the size of the Euclidean circle at the spatial infinity to be some fixed number beta, but locally the size can fluctuate, and we parameterize that locally as beta times e to the phi. Then under dimensional reduction, it gives you a massless field in uh, one less dimension given by this uh, phi field here. Another place that this phi field shows up is in the mass of the winding mode because the mass of the winding mode really depends on the local length of the Euclidean time rather than the length of the Euclidean time at infinity. Okay. And you could expand this mass uh, in power series of phi now the zeroth order term is the mass at infinity. And as I said, Horowitz and Polchinski uh, consider the limit where well, beta is very close to beta hexagon. So th this linear term is very small, but there is some order one coefficient that I'm denoting by kappa here, which is some order one number uh, times this phi view, okay? Now we want to, uh, the idea of Horowitz and Polchinski is to find a condensate solution of chi within this action. And at first sight, it might seem a bit complicated to find a solution, but there is a nice approximation they observe is that if you look at how this chi view is coupled to all the other degrees of freedom, say for example, the little d dimensional metric and the little d dimensional dilaton, all the coupling is coming through this mass square. And as I said, we're working in the limit where mass square is very small and infinity. But there is one particular coupling that is not small in this action is the coupling between chi-square and this phi field. Because as I said, here you have some order one coefficient. Then the idea is to look at the equations of motion of this action uh, in the expansion of this small parameter, which is beta minus beta hexagon divided by string length. And to the leading order, you simply have an equations, equation of motion for the chi field in a non-trivial potential generated by the phi field as well as the Einstein equation describing how a non-zero chi condensate back reacts the, uh, the thermal circle, okay? So these two coupled nonlinear equations can be uh, solved numerically. And actually they have been solved, for example, in the context of gravitating both Einstein condensate um, in the literature. The conclusion is that you could find spherical symmetry a normalizable solution in the following dimensions. When, uh, sorry, when capital D or the space time dimension is equal to four, five, and six. So in these dimensions, you have a normalizable and a, a spherical symmetry solution. The reason that the solution doesn't exist in even in higher dimensions is because in higher dimensions, the gravity uh, or the Newtonian force becomes weak at long distances. As I, as I remind you that as you increase the mass of the string, it also gets bigger and bigger. So it really is a competition effect between the speed that is, is getting bigger and the gravitational attraction. So in high, even higher dimen in dimensions greater than six, the gravitational attraction is simply not strong enough to pull different parts of the string gas together. Now, there are some further development in this direction. For example, in D equals to seven, well, I, I, earlier I said there's no solution. There actually is a solution which is found, but it is with the circle and affinity being exactly at the inverse hexagon temperature. So it's slightly different from uh, the earlier this discussion I showed you. And similar solutions have also been constructed in ADS space in this nice paper. And I believe uh, Rami will also talk about works that involve finding a winding condensate solution in the context of uh, two-dimensional cigar theory. But in this talk, let me focus on the, uh, the case where the space-time di dimension is four. 
And in this case, you can uh, find the solution fairly explicitly numerically. And here I'm showing you some uh, rescaled version of the chi field as, as well as the phi field. And I also rescaled this row, which is the radial coordinate. So the rescaling is such that when you get closer and closer to the inverse hexagon temperature, the solution is getting larger and larger, while the amplitude of this chi field and this phi field are getting smaller and smaller. So it means that the solution is, un, is in better control when you are closer to the he inverse hexagon temperature. The feature of the solution is such that uh, the chi field decays exponentially at long distances. So it's really a localized condensate solution. While the phi field is nothing but a Newtonian potential at long, long distances. So it decays like one over rho. But the crucial thing here is that it is finite and negative in the center. So the Euclidean circle is smaller in the center, but it is not vanishing. It means that this geometry is a horizonless geometry. Okay, so let me make some comments about the Horowitz opportunity solution. Even though it is a solution that is constructed first in the Euclidean signature, because the winding mode is really well defined when you go to Euclidean space time, where you have a circle that you can define this winding mode. But you'll see that many of the properties of this solution has nice interpretation in the Lorentzian signature. I will try to argue that it really describes the coarse grained feature of a star, of a gravitating star that is made of uh, self attracting strings. Now, what are the properties that you can look at uh, for the Lorentzian uh, or, or for this Horowitz opportunity solution? The first property you could look at is related to the puzzle that I showed you earlier that the string is too large to make this correspondence principle work. Now you can ask how does gravity now affect the size of the solution? We can look at the size of the solution by simply continue the metric as well as the stress tensor of the solution into the Lorentzian signature. And that gives us a sense of the size of the solution. And this, the answer that you get is, is, nicely, uh, is nicely resolves the puzzle that we saw earlier. Basically here I'm plotting the size of the solution as a function of the mass. And earlier I talked about this black hole curve where the size grows together with the mass, as well as the, this free string curve where the size also grows with the mass, but uh, as a square root of the mass. Now, if you look at the dependence of the size of the Horowitz opportunity solution as a function of the mass, you'll see that as the mass increases, it actually becomes smaller and smaller, okay? And if you extrapolate the curve of the Horowitz opportunity solution, you see it matches with the curve of the black hole at a place roughly that is where you had expected the black hole to turn into a string. Now in this picture, there are two blobs here. They correspond to uh, regions where we don't have analytic control of the solution. So there is an orange blob, which is supposed to be where the free string curve is supposed to be are connected to the Horowitz opportunity curve, okay? Physically, there shouldn't be any uh, strange thing happening there. What happens is that the gravity just starts to be a little bit strong enough to pull the string together. So we expect it to be a smooth connection between these two curves. Now one can say a little bit more uh, about what really happens in this blob, but let me not go into there uh, because of time. Perhaps more interesting, uh, thing is to try to understand what happened in, in this purple blob, because uh, a naive extrapolation of these two curves suggests they meet somewhere here. So there might be a phase transition between these two curves, or they might be just smoothly connected. These two curves are really just two different parts of the same smooth curve. They might be smoothly interpolated together. So I will try to uh, say more about what really happens here at, at the end of the talk. But for now, let me discuss uh, another property of the, of the Horowitz opportunity solution, which is the thermodynamics. So as usual in the discussion of uh, thermodynamics of the black hole, whenever you have a Euclidean solution, you can apply the so-called Gibbons Hawking procedure to compute its uh, th thermodynamic quantities, in particular, the, uh, the entropy. So if you apply the same idea to compute the entropy using this explicit solution you found, 
you'll see that the entropy has a simple formula that is given by uh, the, the local integral of the density of this chi field multiplying by some uh, number. And in particular, it's a classical entropy, meaning that the entropy is of order one over G string. So it's a very, very large entropy. You could also independently compute the, uh, the mass of the solution. And you see that the entropy to leading order is simply given by inverse hexagon temperature times the mass, plus some corrections that you can work out. The conceptual thing that I want to stress is that using this Euclidean solution, you get an entropy that matches the entropy of a highly excited string gas with corrections. This might not seem uh, very remarkable, but it is a nice example where we already understand the microscopic meaning of the answer that you get from the Gibbons Hawking procedure for this Euclidean method. Okay, so this, this is nice, but still there is a puzzle as uh, I alluded to uh, in the beginning of the talk. So the horowitz pochinski solution, much like the Euclidean black hole solution, it only gives us a coarse grain density of state. It doesn't really reflect the microstates. It gives you a smooth curve, a smooth density of state. It doesn't even tell us that the spectrum of the underlying string gas is discrete. So you might ask, what, what else do you need in this story to get a discrete spectrum? That would be the, uh, the focus of the next part of my talk. Okay, so we want some sharper way to phrase this puzzle. And there is a nice way that is proposed in the literature, which is to look at a quantity called the spectral form factor of the system. So let me now talk a little bit about the spectral form factor just for uh, uh, audiences that are perhaps not familiar with this story. For reasons that is not really crucial for this talk, we will consider a microcanonical uh, variant of the spectral form factor. So the spectral form factor is simply defined as follows in this equation, or more accurately, uh, usually we look at the absolute value of this, uh, the square of the absolute value of this quantity. So it is simply defined as a sum over all the energy, energy eigenstates uh, with a phase that is e to the minus i e times t, now here, because I want to consider a microcanonical variant of, of it. So I'm fixing some energy window uh, in the spectrum. So I'm considering just for convenience, I'm considering a Gaussian filter that uh, I put in here, which is centered around some particular energy E with some width delta, okay? So this is just picks up all the energy eigenstates uh, that are close to energy E and I sum over all these phases. That gives me the, the square of this, gives me the spectral form factor. Now, there are some uh, commonly discussed feature of the spectral form factor in the literature, and it has been a, a, a hot topic uh, in recent years. Some often discussed feature is that at short time, if you look at T that is relatively small, the spectral form factor decays. The reason it decays is very simple. It's just because you have all these random phases and when T is non-zero, they start to cancel each other. So the absolute values will uh, start to decay. And the early time decay is simply governed by the continuous density of state. So this is completely universal and you get this early part of the decay in any quantum mechanical system. Now the late time part might be uh, more specific to what kind of system that you already have. And People usually consider uh, some often discussed examples in the literature are chaotic quantum systems. And in these quantum systems, there is a universal feature, late time feature, which is called the RAMP, which is uh, coming from the random matrix universality in your underlying discrete spectrum. So whenever you have random matrix statistics, it leads to a linear RAMP in the spectral form factor. Of course, if you consider a specific quantum mechanical system, one expects that the spectral form factor is really fluctuating a lot in this uh, late time regime, but the average of that is uh, growing linear. <coughs> now, the final point that might be important, uh, that, that will be important in my discussion is that there is a, uh, the discreteness of the spectrum is reflected in the spectral form factor. Simply, since we have a discrete spectrum, in the end, what we are computing is really a sum over an enormous amount of phases. And when you sum over imaginary, uh, 
enormous amount of phases, you never expect them to cancel exactly uh, if you are dealing with a generic spectrum. That means that at late time, you don't expect this, this quantity to, to be very, very small. You will expect that it will be of order, the square of it should be of order e to the s, well, uh, s is the entropy of the system. So this is usually referred to as the plateau at late time, that is a non-zero late time, uh, long time average value, which signals the discreteness of the spectrum. Okay, so the realm of the spectral form factor is specific to models with random matrix statistics. We don't really expect uh, these to show up in a weekly interacting gas of string, at least a relatively short time. We expect the string system to be uh, still very close to being integrable at short time. It should, uh, the spectral form factor should have the feature that is more like an integrable system. So we don't really expect to see a ramp in our spectral form factor. But the thing I want to stress is that the discreteness should always be there. In other words, the spectral form factor cannot decay forever, okay? So that's the crucial point here. But we run into a puzzle if we consider the spectral form factor for the Horowitz, yes, please. Since the gas of strings is interacting, yes. albeit weakly, um, I would have thought that um, like any interacting system, there should be level repulsion. And so why wouldn't there be random matrix? Statistics? Yes, so it's important here, I'm saying it's a, a relatively short time, I don't expect random matrix statistics, or maybe uh, the if you talk about the spectrum, I would expect the random matrix statistics to be a very fine grain scale of the spectrum, when the energy level are very, very close to each other. But at a larger scale, I don't expect random matrix behavior in a weekly coupled uh, theory. Just to work to. Right, so for example, the GOE statistics that uh, you can get. No, it, uh, here I'm more uh, really connecting to what people said in the literature. I won't really be talking about random matrix in, in, in this talk. I won't be able to reproduce anything about random matrix. So um, here I'm simply saying that at short time, I won't expect uh, random matrix statistics. It will be similar to you start with a free gauge theory and you add a little bit of interaction. A very long time, you, is, you will expect that the spectral form factor might have uh, this RAM behavior, but you don't, you don't expect it to show up at order one time. So uh, maybe it's important to point out that this, you run into puzzle already at order one time a time that is order one in the string scale or some order one number times the string then. Are you saying there are correlations uh, that, so you say long time scales is nearby eigenvalues, you're saying that over exactly. some, some mesoscale, they're, they're non-random. So here I'm considering a very large energy window. Yeah. And I think I would expect uh, uh, at very fine grained scale, there might be some level correlation, but I don't have a obvious reason to expect that the level correlation would penetrate over a very large scale of the spectrum, which is, what is relevant for the spectral form factor at a relatively short time. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, the question that we're already interested in, in here is more about discreteness rather than the random mesh statistics. And we already run into a problem with discreteness if we just look at the Horowitz opportunity solution at a very short time. In other words, we can compute this spectral form factor using the Horowitz opportunity solution. And here I'm plotting the logarithm of the spectral form factor. And we see it becomes negative when T is just some order one number times the string length. So it's a very, very short time. It's a very short time scale. And when it becomes negative, it means that the spectral form factor becomes exponentially small, which a priori there's, we have no reason to expect that. So, 
this puzzle is of course expected because the Horowitz protrusion solution really gives us only the continuous density of state. And if you just have a continuous density of state, you get a decaying answer and decays forever. Okay. Now, well, this is a question well, I first heard from Stephen Schenker and he was proposing that we could try to understand what we have to add to this story in order to get a discrete, a discrete spectrum. This question has been discussed a lot in the black hole contest, but we should be able to say something more concrete in this string con contest, okay? So what do we have to add to this picture? Um, now, I'm, and the following part of the talk will be try to solve this puzzle. And to solve this problem, I have to first retreat to the free string limit to learn some uh, intu intuition. In the free string limit, uh, namely, we now ignore all the gravity attraction. So we are just considering a free string, free string gas uh, and uh, it's described in the first volume of Pochinsky's book. And we know the spectrum of the free string gas. So we can, in fact, compute the spectral form factor numerically. Now, what do you find in, in numerics? You see an initial decay of the curve, which is exactly predicted by this winding mode with winding number one and minus one. But you see it doesn't decay forever. At some time that is of order one in the string length, the curve starts to bend and it starts to rise again. If you zoom in into the rising part of the curve, you see uh, a bump after another. So the detailed feature of this, this rising part is very rich. And the question we want to ask is how do we explain the rise and the detailed feature of the spectral form factor in terms of uh, geometries? Now to, uh, to tell you the answer to this question, I have to take a little bit of detour, but it's, uh, uh, it won't be involving a lot of technical details. It will be a very simple detour, which is I want to talk a little bit about free string partition function. So in the free string limit, we know what the uh, partition function Z of beta is. And for simplicity, let me now just focus on bosonic string in 26 dimensions with all the spatial directions to be compact. The reason I want it to be compact is just because I don't want the continuous the continuum in the spectrum due to the momentum uh, of the string, due to the continuous momentum. So let me, for simplicity, just, just consider compact directions. And now what, what, what can we say about the partition function? The partition function is convergent when the real part of beta is greater than the inverse hexagon temperature but we can in principle analytically continue it into other region in the complex plane. So the purpose of doing this manipulation will be evident in a moment. Such analytic continuation is most clear if we write the thermal free energy as a one loop partition function of a string on the Euclidean thermal manifold, similar to what I earlier, what I talked about in, uh, for the construction of the winding mode. So let me briefly review this uh, very elementary, but I find a very deep construction. So this is the uh, expression for the, of course, the free energy of a free string. It's given by an integral over the fundamental domain in the upper half plane times a sum of this form. So it's a sum of exponentials. And in the exponential, you have this factor B and C, which are nothing but, so this B is nothing but proportional to the mass of the string modes that you have in this Euclidean manifold. So you'll see that you have the, wind, uh, the momentum contribution, winding contribution, as well as the oscillator numbers, oscillator contributions in the spatial direction. Of course, since here I'm taking the spatial directions to be compact, you also have the momentum and winding contribution there. Um, the C factor here is nothing but imposing the level matching condition on this uh, background, okay? Here I'm using alpha to denote all the quantum numbers uh, collectively. Now, the idea is we want to analytically continue this partition function into uh, uh, regions in the complex beta plane where it is originally not convergent. So if we look at each term, we see that each term is only convergent when the, uh, as tau two goes to infinity, when the real part of, the, of this B coefficient is greater than zero. Now, this analytic continuation was actually described in detail in this nice paper in uh, 89. And after the analytic continuation, you end up with a bunch of poles in the complex plane. And the poles are located at uh, 
at places where b is equal to zero, namely some string modes that become becoming massless, as well as c is also equal to zero, that is just enforcing the uh, level mesh condition. Okay, in other words, the singularities of the free string partition function are at places where string modes becoming tachyonic. This is of course reasonable from the space time perspective because you have some, uh, some fields that becomes massless. And in this equation, I have this factor D here. This factor D is a degeneracy factor because in general, there are many string modes that can become tachyonic at some particular value of beta tilde. Now the commonly known singularity is of course nothing but the hackathon temperature that I mentioned earlier. And there we have D equals to two, because as I said, you have a winding mode with winding number plus one and a winding mode with winding number minus one. And it gives you a simple pole in the uh, free string partition function. Now, if you, do a, uh, if you do a Laplace transformation of these, you simply get a density of hackathon density of state, a continuous density of state. An uh, interesting feature that I want to stress here is that most of the singularity beta tilde, they are actually complex. They don't lie on the real axis. And the fact that they are complex will be very important in the discussion of the spectral form factor that I will talk about later. Now, this is, uh, now let, let, let me end the detour. What do all this have to do with the spectral form factor? To see this, let's first examine a simpler quantity, namely the density of state of string. So in principle, the density of state is given by an inverse Laplace transformation of the free string partition function. And it's given by an integral over beta where the int integration contour is along an imaginary axis where the real part of this contour is greater than any of the singularity. But once you see a picture like this, you can't help but deforming the contour leftwards and start to pick up the contribution from each of these poles. And you can ask, what do the poles give you? Of course, the pole at some particular beta tutor just gives you a contribution that goes like rho goes like e to the beta tutor times the energy. In particular, the, the pole that is to the uh, rightmost pole, which is the inverse hexagon temperature, just gives you the leading hexagon density of state. But here you see there are actually tiny corrections to the hexagon density of state given by all these other poles. There are tiny corrections because all of them have a real part that is smaller than the inverse hexagon temperature. Therefore, they are usually not talked about in the, uh, in the usual thermodynamic discussion because they never dominate. But they become very important in the discussion of spectral form factor. The spectral form factor as defined in this formula can be computed in a much very similar way as uh, we did in the density of state. So you can rewrite this formula exactly in a form that looks somewhat like inverse Laplace transformation. With the difference that in the exponent, now you have a quadratic term, which comes from this uh, Gaussian width that I inserted, as well as since you, have a, you are looking at a quantity at some time t, you see that once you work this out, you, you have a z of beta plus i t rather than z of beta t. So now we have a formula like that, we can also start to deforming, deform the contour leftwards and pick up the contribution from all these poles. And you see that the pole at beta tutor contributes um, a, a value of the spectral form factor that goes like this. Now, I want you to just focus on this particular part of the uh, answer, which is the time dependence. And the crucial point is that the contribution of the pole at beta tutor does not give you a decaying answer uh, that is centering around t equals to zero. It is maximized when t is equal to the imaginary part of beta tutor. So it is, so it could be a, a possible contribution that can expand this late time behavior because they are already maximized when uh, the time is being non-zero, okay? Now, where, uh, so wh where are the singularities, let's say in uh, bosoni string theory? Of course, one can, one should uh, repeat this story in superstring and I did that in the paper, but the basic lesson stays unchanged. Now for simplicity, let me uh, consider the bosoni string and forget about the usual tachyon. Then the singularities in the bosoni string theory are roughly shown like in this picture. Of course, there are infinite number of them, 
But here I'm just showing all the contribution from winding modes with winding numbers smaller than two, as well as oscillator numbers smaller or equal to than five. And in this picture, all the orange dots corresponds to the string modes with winding number two, and the blue dots correspond to the winding number one modes. In particular, we have this usual uh, singularity, the inverse hackathon temperature here. Now, another feature now we, we should look at in this, in this formula, the contribution, is that when t is equal to imaginary part of beta tilde, this is zero. And at the peak uh, of the contribution, we get uh, this quantity, which is larger if the real part of beta tilde is larger. So this tells us that if we want to focus on the dominant feature of the spectral form factor for strings, we are most interested in the singularities that are most to the right of this picture. Namely, in this picture, it will be uh, this singularity that I, that I circled, okay? So there are actually infinite, um, infinitely many singularities along this line. And in string theory, uh, in bosonic string theory, and in, more generally in type two and heterotic string theory as well, they come from the following winding modes. So they come from the winding mode that carry winding number one and minus one. So here I'm excluding this orange dot because that is hidden behind this original singularity. And I'm only focusing on the blue dots. So they carry winding number one and minus one, but different from the usual winding mode, they also carry momentum along the time direction, okay? So they are, if you think about the string, they are also moving along the Euclidean time direction. They also carry some oscillator modes in the transverse directions. And it's intriguing, it's interesting that these leading singularities, they correspond to string modes which carry purely left moving or purely right moving uh, oscillator modes. Okay? And because of level meshing condition, the uh, momentum number is equal to the, or opposite to the oscillator number. And this completely uh, reproduces the feature that we saw earlier in the numerical result for the spectral form factor of strings. You see that if you, now consider the imaginary part of all these singularities, they match precisely to the location where you found the, uh, the peak of all these bumps. And each of these bumps correspond to some particular string mode that becomes massless at this complex value of uh, beta. And this curve is also slowly rising. This is due to the degeneracy factors coming from the fact that where as you go, um, towards large T, you are incre increasing the oscillator number. So there is an increasing number of string modes that becomes massless there. So there is a, a slow rising due to the degeneracy factor. Okay, now let's uh, go back to the case where we have a little bit of gravity attraction. What do we expect? We expect the existence of a family of horowitz poczynski like solutions corresponding to these other string modes. So we know that as we go from free string picture, so this is the numerical result of the free string picture to the picture where we have a little bit of gravity attraction, we know what's the corresponding uh, decaying part of the curve, which is simply the horowitz poczynski solution, as I told you earlier. It's very, uh, I find it very reasonable to suggest that there are a family of classical solutions corresponding to these other string modes, they start to dominate in the spectral form factor at a, a time that is relatively short, okay? There are two reasons that uh, this suggestion seems quite likely to me. Uh, the first reason is a physical argument. We don't expect a phase transition between free string and the gravitating string gas. So qualitative features that you see in the free stream should remain at least at relatively short time. That tells you that at relatively short time, the, here is a short time the t is of order the order one times the string length. We expect this curve to look roughly the same. So that's the first reason that you expect a similar feature in the weakly interacting case. The second reason is that the important coupling involved in constructing the Horowitz opportunity solution is rather universal. It doesn't uh, involve uh, very complicated interactions. The only interaction that is important here is the coupling 
of the string mode that you have in mind with the radian or the size of the Euclidean circle. Now, this coupling comes in entirely from the mass term of the winding mode. And it is universal for all these other string modes that uh, I just told you about, okay? So based on these two reasons, uh, it's very uh, likely that there are uh, these generalizations of Horowitz opportunity solution for these other string modes as well. So other interactions, for example, it's like quality terms for these string modes that are suppressed at long distances compared to the leading uh, gravity effect. Now, let me talk a little bit more about these solutions. To construct the solution, you will fix the boundary length of your space time to at infinity to be close to the complex value where the string mode that you have in mind become massless. I have to admit that this is rather formal if you, if you think about it, in particular in the canonic example, because the real part of all this uh, length will be smaller than the inverse hexagonal temperature. But in terms of the quantity that we're computing here, we are trying to do a micro canonic example discussion and we are fixing the energy. Similar to the Horowitz opportunity solution, if you, if you have such solution via the Gibbons Hawking procedure, they will give you a density of state that is suppressed than the density of state given, given by the Horowitz opportunity solution because they have an exponent that has a real part that is smaller than the inverse hexagonal temperature. Or more accurately, since this will not be a a uh, real contribution, you should really sum over the solution with its complex conjugate, and it will give you a exponentially rising um, contribution to the, to the density of state as well as an oscillating uh, profile. Of course, this is a behavior which you can, um, which you can uh, show explicitly for the free string case. But here we are conjecturing that even when you have a little bit of uh, weak gravity interaction at relatively long scale in the spectrum, we still expect this kind of fluctuation to still exist. So the weak interaction doesn't destroy this kind of fluctuations entirely. Now, these solutions, they correspond to ripples in the density of state. We have the leading Horowitz opportunity solution, but these other solutions, they give rise to subleading but the fluctuation, fluctuations in the density of state. If we include more and more of them, we get closer and closer to the discrete spectrum. But the way that they come into the story is rather gradually. They don't destroy the Horowitz opportunity solution, but they add to it. And by including more of them, we approach the limit where we have a discrete spectrum. Of course, there are important caveats in um, comparing this to the microstate geometry. Unlike the usual microstate geometry discussion, there are complex settle points. And they do not have obvious Lorentzian interpretation, even though I think it would be a very interesting question to try to understand whether they have any Lorentzian significance. They dominate in the spectrum. So I think uh, th there are some subleading uh, contribution to the spectrum. So I think they should have some imprint in some dynamical quantities that you consider in the Lorentzian signature. But ultimately, as I've presented here, there are some complex settles, and there are perhaps more similar to the complex settles that have been discussed in the Angstufo for Sylvia Mills 116 BPA state counting story uh, that is discussed recently for, uh, by Aharoni and collaborators, as well as by Samir Murthy and collaborators. Another caveat is that we don't expect to really approach individual uh, microstates in this way. There are several reasons. For one thing, for the reason, a reason I haven't had time to discuss, the Horowitz approximation will break down at some late time scale, at some time that is related to the G string, that is some inverse power of the G string. Another reason is that as uh, Emil was talking about, uh, even with a little interaction, one might expect some random matrix universality, universality at a very fine grain scale of the spectrum. We expect this to kick in at a much later time. Now, what, what is the correct picture at a much later time? Do we give up the geometry picture and return to the quantum fastball and just think about the fastball already uh, of this string in the Lorenzi signature? Or can there be any effective descriptions in terms of the wormholes as was taught to us by Sashankar and Stanford that wormhole there are a universal description of the late time ramp in the spectral form factor. 
or are they secretly the, secretly the same thing? Okay. Now let me come to the last part of the talk uh, for the last few minutes. Um, if we further increase the gravity attraction or the mass, we expect the string star to collapse into a black hole as uh, alluded to by this purple blot in, in the picture. So the, now the nature of this transition in terms of classical solutions, both the, whole, both the whole risk opportunity solution and the black hole, they are classical solutions in string theory can be phrased as a question of whether there is a phase transition in between the two Walsh CFTs underlying these two classical solutions. Now, as was discussed in this paper I wrote with uh, Juan and Edward last year, in the type two string theory, there is an index argument, which seems to suggest that uh, there is an obstruction against a smooth in interpolation between the two solutions. In the heterotic string case, we have found no obstructions. I should mention that there have been proposals of how one might get around the index argument in some other situations. In particular, I think Remy will talk a little bit about that in, in his talk. The question I want to ask, but I don't have an answer is that, let's say that the early part, earlier part of the curve is replaced by the black hole as we further increase the mass or the gravity attraction. What happens to the later part of the curve? Okay, now let me summarize. So we talked about the horowitz potency solution and its generalizations. They capture a certain information of the string microstates. The story has a natural analog in gauge theories where the winding mode are uh, replaced by the polyacop loop in gauge theory. I will say, save this story for a discussion session next week. In that case, one, it seems that one can say a little bit more about what happens at late time. Uh, in particular, one can say a little bit about what happens at strong coupling. Well, there seems to be an effective wormhole picture which emerges. I hope that it's okay that I say something about wormholes next week. <laughs> um, so now uh, uh, the, the last thing that I didn't have time to talk about is that uh, it was discussing this paper that I wrote with Juan and Edward is that Using solution generating technique, you can construct charged Horowitz potency solutions. And they describe the near extremal limit of black holes carrying momentum and winding charges in an extra dimension. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Questions? We all start. Uh, do you have an intuition about the Lorentzian picture of these uh, ripples on yet. top of yeah, the? Not yet. Okay. If I have, I would talk mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a little confused about mm -hmm. um, how to relate things in the time domain to the energy domain. Okay. Um, so could you say again what? what the spectral statistics um, are telling you about time scales and ramps and plateaus and so on. So right, right. I have, in other words, if I have like weak interaction, yeah. Um, why is so you have weak interaction and there should be some time scale that are inversely uh, related to that weak interaction, such as time scale that are of order one over G string to some power. Here I'm talking at a much, much shorter time scale. That is right. time scale that is independent of the interaction. This time scale arise because there are long wavelength fluctuations in the spectrum uh, that has the form of the cosine times some some number that is just uh, related to the string length times the energy. So uh, there are already long wavelength oscillations in the spectrum, which you can show explicitly uh, like in the free string case. And if you consider the spectral form factor, this oscillation will give you some uh, particular uh, contribution to the spectral form factor that are dominating when the time is of order as these frequencies that are here is uh, the imaginary part of this beta tilde. What happens at later time, I don't have a concrete uh, uh, story to tell. That, that, that modulation is coming from what feature of the, of 
the string? So you could. Is this like some process, some kind of collective attraction? Yeah, I think here you are asking more about whether this oscillation in the spectrum has any dynamic in interpretation, right? Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's part of the question that I, I would like to understand. So uh, I, I don't think I have a concrete uh, physical picture for you right now, but it would be interesting. So here you could say it's just coming from the spectrum, adding, adding all the oscillator modes of the string and to get this electricity. But of course it should leave some imprint on uh, the collective motion of this string gas in the Lorentz signature. Uh, I'm not sure what is the best way to uh, approach this question. So I guess if the string is weakly interacting, you expect there to be, if there's a, if there's a string at some energy, you expect there to be another one with sort of an energy plus L string corresponding to adding one more oscillator mode. Mm -hmm. um, so is, but, is that is that related to the features you're talking about on no, the scale L, no, I don't L think, string? Or? I don't think that's the feature because adding only one string or some small amount of oscillator mode will only change the energy very, uh, very uh, will only make a very small change to the energy. But here, this oscillation, they all appear at the, much larger scale at an energy that is order one in, uh, in the alpha prime. You see what I'm saying? If you, the energy of the, the energy of the uh, string goes like square root of the square root of n, well, n is the oscillator number. If you change n to n plus one, it only changes the energy by a tiny amount. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, this will be some coherent oscillation. I just don't have uh, more co concrete things to say. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll try that. More questions? I'm a bit confused about the solution with the F1 and P charge. So that solution is Euclidean or Minkowskian? Sorry, can you say what, what the solution with F1 and P charge? Oh, uh, is also a Euclidean solution. So you start with a Euclidean solution and generalize a Euclidean solution. Mm -hmm. So the fields are complex or? No, in this discussion, the fields are, uh, well, the fields are real. Yeah, the fields are yeah. So then the action is some bounding below. Usually when you have a Euclidean solution with electric fields, you either have imaginary fields or you have unbounded below action. So this either one or the other. So I'll just right. Uh, that's a good question. Let me see. I take it back. I think you can uh, you can discuss this with uh, imaginary uh, gauge fields in the Euclidean signature. So they, they will be real in the Lorentz signature, but they are imaginary in the Euclidean signature. Hmm. I guess related question is uh, like these Euclidean solutions that you have, they're complex, right, in general? Um, you mean the these other solutions that I'm alluding to? Yeah. Family? Yes, exactly. So the, these, these solutions like, is there any way to check, uh, like, if they have allowable complex metrics in the oh, sense of uh, so, Kostevich and Sega? Yeah, here because the back reaction is very small, so basically you have flat space. With the only thing is that the time direction is compatible with the with the length of beta plus it. So a metric like that is always allowable. That's an interesting question. It would be different if it's a black hole because the Euclidean circle shrink. And uh, I have some more comments about that in, in, in my paper. Uh, that is irrelevant for the talk today. More questions? Uh, uh, in the beginning, you uh, had uh, uh, you talked about the first transition from the free string to the horowitz polchinski okay, and you yes. said you had much more to say, but in view of time, you... Um, yes, so, well, it's just some qualitative uh, Thing that you can say about how to understand this transition. So you could ask uh, the horowitz polchinski solution is some classical solution. So why should it transition to something else, right? 
the, the thing you could do is that you should only trust a classical solution when the quantum fluctuation around it is small. So you can do some scaling analysis of how large the quantum fluctuation are there uh, around the classical solution. And you see the quantum fluctuation becomes un uncontrolled when the mass is of this scale that I'm showing here. So this plot is specific to four dimensions. Now you could also ask about the free string case and that is, you could also ask when does the bound state uh, start to form if you approach from the free string side. And this was, I think, discussed in the original papers by Horowitz and Poshinsky. The idea is you consider a Schrodinger equation of uh, some particle with a uh, mass that is of order string scale in a gravitational potential generated by the free string gas. And you ask when does the bound state solution of the Schrodinger equation start to form? And uh, by doing that simple analysis, you also see that starts to form when the mass is of order uh, this scale. So it's just some, it's just, you could understand how this come about from both sides. Okay, another question? Where's the cube? So probably a very naive question, but I always been kind of confused by one thing, just naively. You start with a free string solution, you transition to a Howard Sponchinsky, but then, and the purple blob, you then transition to a black hole. Do you have any idea on how you can have a solution that actually develops an horizon? And do you have, do you think that you can have, use these kind of approaches to explain some high kind of horizon formation of some sort and this yeah, description that, at least? Yeah, that, that's definitely the ultimate thing one would like to understand. But unfortunately, I think uh, we don't really have a clear understanding of what was, what's going on in that purple blob. I have to say there are some recent uh, uh, recent discussion by uh, Kutasov and uh, collaborators, as well as uh, in Rami's talk. I think these are interesting uh, proposals which might shed more light on what, what exactly happens at the transition point. Okay. So maybe as uh, Okay, I'll postpone the question in one hour. <laughs> Thank you. I have a comment. So there are some examples of solutions which are basically, I mean, if you look at this super tubes or some of the microstate geometries, which you can construct in the weak coupling regime, in the regime of gravity is not important. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with them is that unlike horowitz poczynski solutions, which when gravity becomes larger, they become smaller. Uh, those solutions and gravity becomes larger, they actually grow. Yeah, yeah. And they grow at the same rate as the black hole. The key ingredient seems to be the fact that they have non perturbative degrees of freedom. They have some debris, which whose mass goes like one over G string. And when the system spins around, the debris become larger. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any way to try to get some horowitz poczynski type of condensate which also grows. Because you know, if, if you want to do, to do an honest to goodness black hole microstate, which replaces the black hole at all ranges, you need to have something which is the same size as the black hole. So when gravity becomes longer, a larger, it needs to be some gas of, you know, some. Some up some some animal which grows with G uh, with 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 G string. So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if there's any way to incorporate in this effective theory, maybe some way you know this not this these degrees of freedom to mimic again what's happening for the examples of uh, of microstate geometries to grow to get something which grows with G G Newton. Right. In, in this specific context, uh, um, Well, in this specific context, I don't see a, a clear way to do that. Maybe uh, one relevant thing is uh, I could say a little bit more about this charge black hole case. So as you know, if you have a black hole that carries momentum and winding charge, the black hole is getting smaller, actually smaller and smaller as you uh, approach the extremal limit for this kind of black hole and approach a singular, uh, uh, singular black hole. But what happened, yes, what happens is that if you rather considering the horowitz poczynski solution and you approach extremality, it's becoming larger and larger. So in this case, it's kind of eating up the black hole. And uh, the size of the horowitz poczynski solution really corresponds to uh, the size of a string that you respect when you have a lot of, uh, uh, when, when it carries a lot of winding at the momentum charge in an extra dimension. system we know the we know the extremal microstates you know the microstates correspond to the you know to the to the f1p system you know becoming large and you know we know we know we don't understand microscopically also in the in the d5 system understand microscopic what the microstates are and we see that they actually become large there's a naive black hole which is small but the real microstates of the system which are actually given by the super tubes they actually become large yes. 
Canon, can we make a connection there? And can we can I see, for example, that you know the fact that the Horace Pochinsky condensate also grows? Is there some connection with? Um. So here, I, maybe the uh, well. Let me see. So I think one relevant comment might be that uh, in the usual core with Pochinsky discussion, there is a transition to free stream when when the uh, when the mass is becoming very small. Now. In, the, in this charge, the discussion, I'm, I'm not really making the mass more, but we are, I'm taking the extremal limit. What happens is that under the solution generating technique, this transition between Horowitz opportunity solution and free string is mapped to the approach to extremality. So very close to extremality, I think the correct thing that one would say is that you shouldn't trust the Horowitz opportunity solution anymore. And you really get back to the free string picture, just the free string with uh, uh, a lot of winding and momentum charge. And in that picture, the microstate oh. is just explicit. Ah, oh, so this is just the F1P system. Actually, so in, in so close to extremity, we said that you have the F1P system, which is just giving all the all the two charge microstates, which are yeah, it's just the, I see. And then, the but even but but that's back reacted actually. That's still back reacted. That, no. that, that, that free string picture is still back reacted somehow. I mean, that's. I think by this uh, by this consideration, I think the idea is that the. I think the idea would be that the, when you approach the extremality, the string becomes so large that the bit back reaction is very, very, very weak. And it won't be this, the quantum, quantum fluctuation of the string will be very large and won't be described by a particular class. You're saying system. that if I, if I hit up that system, so if I have, you know, let's, let's say I have my two chart microstate, which I know I love, you know, my, my super tubes or my FT system, and then I hit them up, you are saying that at some point there's a horowitz porchinsky phase, which should take over. It's not so somehow these microstates. If I keep on hitting, hitting them up, there should be some transition into into this horowitz porchinsky phase. Yeah, I think it could be. I need oh, to think okay. more about it. We should discuss next week because that's that's really, that's really exciting. I mean, that's really interesting because you know there's a way to link because you know there we know exactly the fastballs and the, the fastballs are the free strings essentially, and you're basically saying that there's a new phase of of these mm -hmm. things which which come which comes with some horowitz porchinsky Okay, thanks. thanks that, that, that's very interesting. But in that case, the typical states are also very small yeah. in the two-chair yeah. system. They are, it's like the black hole. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Yiming again. Thanks.